Yeah. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Better Divorce Podcast. You know who I am, but just in case you don't, my name is Paulette Rigo, credentialed private mediator, certified divorce coach, and founder of Better Divorce Academy, author of Better Divorce Blueprint. That's enough about me, but today we have a super special guest. Her name is Kate Anthony, and she is launching her brand new book, and you need to go get it now. It's called The D Word. Don't you love that? Making the ultimate decision about your marriage. And she's also the host of the critically acclaimed podcast called the Divorce Survival Guide Podcast. And she has a course, just in case you're asking, called Should I Stay or Should I Go? So welcome, Kate. I'm so honored and thrilled you're here. Thank you so much, Paula. It's so great to be here with you. You are so welcome. I love, love, love this talk conversation. I was going to say topic, but then I switched it to conversation. So now I tend to put those words to, words together and make politisms, I call it. So let's start. <laughs> I know I make up words. So let's talk about this darn decision. Mm. I mine and man, it sucked. I had two decisions to make one to quit my job and one to divorce my spouse. And I couldn't decide which one to do first. I had had a career for 20 years that I hated. Not all of it, but I, it wasn't a good fit anymore. Uh, I was 18 when I jumped into it. I'm now 38 thinking, what the hell am I doing with a rhinestone tiara, pink tights on, and a tutu? What am I doing teaching ballet? I don't even like ballet. And uh -huh. that's a whole long story. But I decided to 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 leave that career and it was so 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 hard for many 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 reasons those of you that know me know it but it it gave me the courage muscles to make the decision mm, to, to mm -hmm. then move on so that's my journey but man it took me 10 years and about yeah. 10 years so I know from the work I do that it just isn't this is not a decision that is ever taken lightly Right? No, it's, it is so hard and it takes years and it does sometimes take the courage of doing something else, right? Making another decision and recognizing who you are and that actually I'm strong enough and actually I can do this. And for many people, the opposite happens where they finally get through the divorce and then there's a cascade on the other side of the divorce of all of the other things, all the other changes that they make in their lives because they've just made this major change and like, oh, my life doesn't fit with this anymore, right? So right. however you come to it, um, but the but the agonizing for years, I was 38 as well um, when I finally made the decision and I'd been agonizing for years. I mean, honestly... I even agonized about whether I should marry the guy. <laughs> that's, you know, that's where I was at, right? It's really, really, um, it's, ag it is, let's say agonizing one more time. Um, but it is, it's like soul wrenching, right? You just, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, when I was going through it, there was no, um, there was no Instagram, there were no podcasts, like we didn't have as much information as we have access to now. Yeah. And so I really hope to, you know, my sort of mission in this world is to make as much information as accessible as possible so that people don't have to struggle as long as you and I did. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with the, there wasn't any resources. Uh, I was interviewing some someone earlier and I told this story about how I sat in the self-help section of Walden books. Yeah. Uh, there, I remember there was a relationship section, but it was only an aisle and mm -hmm. there, there was no divorce section. God, mm -mm, they no. have a divorce section. They have a marriage section and a relationship section, but they don't talk about divorce. But then mm -hmm. there was, I think, three or four aisles of self-help books. Mm -hmm. And I would just sit there on the floor yeah. trying to absorb as much wisdom as I could so mm -hmm. that I could make this decision. And I luckily found a therapist in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, because I'm from Boston, mm -hmm. and her name is Amira Kirschenbaum. And she wrote I love Mira. She's the best. I yes. read every one of her books, and she helps. Yes. 
And I loved her book about too good to stay, too bad to leave. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Because sorry, I think I said that backwards. Too, <laughs> too bad to stay. Too yeah. good, to, whatever, whatever. I yeah, know yeah. I get it wrong all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too, too good, too good to leave. Too bad to stay. Whatever. You get the idea. Too, maybe see. I, do. I but, think it's the other just, way around, but it doesn't matter. And, and everyone and knows was, Mira's book. <laughs> I know amazing. everybody knows Mira's book, but she asks thirty-seven questions in the book, mm -hmm. and they're these very mm -hmm. like, you know, litmus test little like, ooh, ooh, yeah. Ooh, uh -huh. get you thinking. So, but that was the internet back then, right? I mean, for me, right, that sure, was my internet. Sure. There were no blogs, internet, Pinterest, YouTube, Google, and Lord knows there was no chat GPT. So here we are in 2020, almost four, and you're launching this book. And it's people like you and myself too, and many other trailblazing divorce, I hate to use the word experts, but people that are really on a mission to help people divorce mm -hmm. with grace and wisdom and dignity and make a smart choice. So why is it such a gut-wrenching decision? And why is it so damn hard to make the decision? Oh gosh. I mean, there's so many reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the first is, you know, if you have kids, you're ripping your family apart. That's what we think, right? That's the story right, that's we tell ourselves. We're right. ripping our family apart. We're going to destroy our children in the process. It's selfish. We're, you know, we're women. If, if, I mean, you and I are, but, you know, um, if you are a woman and a mother, then like it's all of that, you know, you don't get to say. You don't get to make this decision on your own. You don't get to make a unilateral decision for everybody in the family. It's selfish. It's, you know, and I mean, all, all the stories we tell ourselves, all of the, you know, the negative self-talk, how we're not, you know, and also for women, we are so conditioned yeah. to be so, um, you know, we backseat our lives right? We put ourselves in the back seat of our lives in so many aspects. And we're told that this is the noble thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We got to sacrifice, you know, for our kids and for our families. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's all BS. It's complete BS. And, but it's really hard for women to say, you know, I always talk about how, like, as women, we, um, you know, we wait for boys to ask us to dance at the school dance. You know, we sit along the wall waiting for them to choose us. We, you know, wait for boys or, and men to ask us on dates. We wait for men to ask us to marry them. So the idea that we get to make a choice, that we actually get to decide something is, you know, insanity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't compute with our conditioning. Yeah. It, I also felt that, uh, so where do I start? That idea that you make such a good point. I remember the high school dance sitting there thinking, I really like this song. I, and I'm a dancer, by the way. Everyone knows I'm a dancer. Right. Why do I not just get my ass up there and just go dance? Cause, oh, I have to be asked to dance. And yeah. occasionally there'd be a brave bunch of girls that would get up and dance by themselves, you know, but, but it is that feeling of being chosen, right? Or being uh -huh. asked or being invited. I remember when I was uh, proposed to, he didn't really ask me. He told me to marry him. It was a sentence. <gasps> he simply said two words, marry me. Mm. That was the statement. And I didn't feel that there was another option. Um, and I know mm. this is a, you know, a little bit of an R rated answer, but back in my sarcastic 22 year old, I said, eat me. <laughs> That truly was my answer. Good for you. And, now, and the, but, but you still married him. I did. I still, <laughs> okay. And to this day, I actually never said, okay. Then he said, well, aren't you going to call your parents? So everybody, you know, it, it doesn't matter, but the, the, the idea that we don't have control over our own mm -hmm. lives, um, yeah. I always felt that we could fix it too. Like, a woman's job is to fix everything, right? Like, that's right. To, that's right. To make it better, mm -hmm. right? That's so right. So a child falls down and we need to put a Band-Aid on their, you know, we want to, don't get me wrong. I was the first sure. to sweep them up and hug them and love them. And, you know, but we immediately say, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it'll, it'll get right. better, you know. And and sometimes you can't fix everything. You can't just put a Band-Aid on a broken marriage and make it all better. 
No? Yeah, as we reminisce about our childhood. So without giving the cliff notes of the book, I want to dive into it now that we've kind of Mm -hmm. played with all the reasons why it's such a damn hard decision to make in the first place. And that's a good thing. Like, I do believe that Mm -hmm. it should be. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Right. This is, uh, listen, I don't know anyone who gets divorced on a whim, right? It it is a big decision and it should be a big decision. Absolutely. We just have to make sure that we're making it uh, with the right tools and from the right place in our, you know, in our hearts and minds. Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, I really, I, I love that, you know, back when you were 38 and you were, um, sitting in the aisle, the self help aisles at the bookstore. I didn't even know to do that. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't even know because, you know, the first part of my book is about self work, right? Because we spend so much time, looking at, you know, the other person and what's he doing and like, is it bad enough to go? Right. Is it, is it, you know, bad enough to leave? Um, is it good enough to stay? And, you know, shout out Mira again. Um, but the, the, you know, the fact of the matter is that really it needs to start with ourselves. And you intuitively knew that by going to the self-help section um, and sort of learning how to bolster yourself. And that's exactly the work that I do with my clients. It's exactly the work that we start with in the book because it is the important piece. Yes. Um, and I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I would drop the kids off at the bus or school, you know, depending on what age they were in. And this went on for years. You know, I would mm-hmm. think like, okay, what can I do to make the marriage work? I immediately read all the Joel Olstein books because I thought if I found Jesus and God and, and I'm Catholic, so I don't mean to sound sarcastic. I'm from Boston. Everyone is Catholic. Yeah, right, and, exactly. And, sar- <laughs> and sarcastic. So, um, right. I get, I got, I got both genes. So I immediately thought, Oh my, like if Jesus can't fix this and God can't fix this, what can I do? So I read all those. And then I read all the, like, be the perfect wife. Um, I'd run upstairs, brush my teeth, put my hair, do my makeup, make sure the house was perfect. The kids were perfect. Dinner was on the table. I did that for a few years and they realized, well, that's not working. I did. I tried everything to to be the perfect wife and mother and fix the marriage. And I am a constant learner, so I love to read, 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 listen, 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 listen. But so I don't know why I intuitively sat in the bookstore. Um, but it did fill a, a void where I thought, ooh, there's knowledge out there. I don't yes. have it, but I want it. Mm-hmm. So Tell us a little bit about how you break the book down. Mm-hmm. And you said you started with that doing the work or the self, the inner work. Kind yeah. of walk us through, like I said, the cliff notes of the book. Like, what what mm-hmm. is the experience that uh, the should we say the outline of what people are going to get and learn from mm-hmm. diving diving into it? Yeah. So, you know, the first part of the book is really, like I said, it, well, actually, let's, the very first part, uh, is the, um, in the introduction, I answer two really important questions. One is, should I stay in my marriage for my kids? Mm-hmm. Um, and the other one is, to, is about permission and giving women the permission to make this choice mm-hmm. because I don't feel like you can even move beyond the question without being given permission to even ask the question and also to know some facts about the data and the research and what it says about staying in marriages for, you know, for your children. So I sort of address those things first. Um, and then I go into the self work and it, you know, that, that ranges from, um, you know, connect. I talk a lot about, you know, women's intuition and how we just know things Mm -hmm. and we really do, but how also culturally a lot of systems have been set up and designed to, um, suppress our ability to connect with our intuition and what we know to be true. And so I help women, um, I help the reader kind of reconnect with those pieces. Um, and then do, there's other pieces of the self work. I don't need to get into everything. Um, sure. uh, you're just gonna have to read the book. Um, and then <laughs> but a lot of self study and self inquiry. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and then I move into, you know, what is a healthy relationship? Like what, what does a healthy relationship even look or feel like? Like, is this relationship healthy? (laughs) Does this, 
I'm, do I move into that next? I think I might, the next, I think actually before I get into that, I don't have it in front of me. I should probably grab it. Well, you've got um, a whole pile there on your shelf. So there we really should show do. everybody what it looks like. Yeah. This is what it looks like. It's gorgeous. gorgeous. It's so pretty, isn't it? I love the color. It kind of matches your lipstick. Oh. <laughs> and your drapes. It's, it's um yes. Listen, I'm very on brand around here. <laughs> so uh, so the next section that I that I move into is not about um the healthy relationships. It's about why are women so unhappy in their marriages? Why marriage exhausts women and it benefits men. And so it's something that I think most women feel innately and intuitively because there's our intuition again. We're kind of like, he's yeah. getting a really good deal here. Oh, and I'm, I'm kind of getting a, the, right the raw end of the stick. What is going on? And and so I, I really break that down with a lot of data, a lot of science, a lot of research that like, yes, honey, your intuition is 100% on point. Yeah. It, it, you know, this does work out, work really well for him. And it is kind of a, it's, it's, you know, kind of not for you. <laughs> right. Um, and then I go, and then I talk about love. Like, what is like, cause I hear so many people say, but like, but I love him. And I want to say like, what do you mean by that? Mm. What is love? Right. How do we actually define love? I think a lot of women define it, um, from, from not a grounded spiritual place, not about sort of what this marriage gives you and provides you, right? But it's a habit. Um, for many people, it's it's also a trauma bond. Yes. Um, right. And so I get into that next, which is like, you know, what is abuse? Like, what is this thing? And what does a healthy relationship um, even look like? You know, and I outline all the various forms of abuse and, you know, what, what I've learned over the last, you know, over, over 10 years, over decade of doing this work is that more people are, more women are being emotionally, financially, um, and all sorts of, uh, but really in those, those two in particular, um, emotionally and financially abused than I ever thought or knew. Um, and it's funny cause people are like, but you just talk about it so much. So people come to you cause you talk about it so much. And I have to say like, listen, I, I talk about it so much because it's because, because it, that's what they're all coming to me for. Like I wasn't talking yeah. about it to begin with, even though that's my experience, I was not talking about it, but then it became like, yeah. oh my God, you guys are all this. Wait a minute. What? Hold on a minute. We can't talk about x y or z because they're first there's abc like what this is not okay we're not healing this we're not, mm -hmm. like, you know the reason you feel so totally um insane or like you're like losing your grip on reality is because you're being psychologically manipulated mm -hmm. you know and so there's a lot many of, of these, many of these people too, and, and we don't want to pick on, you know, the, the, the battle of the sexes here, but if you're not in a healthy, yeah, I know I'm, that was a little sarcastic. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> pardon about that. If, if you've not grown up in a healthy, a family dynamic and mom and dad yes. perhaps or uncles and aunts or you know the family as a whole That's right. you haven't witnessed or experienced what a healthy family dynamic or marriage looks like and then you get married and you uh, have mirrored or duplicated that same dynamic of what you have grown up in and you mm -hmm. now have the fa a dynamic that is not healthy, whether that's psychological, mental, emotional, physical, sexual, financial, spiritual abuse, manipulation, whatever that entails, it's kind of what you know. It's, it's kind right. of the norm, right? It's absolutely it's not yeah. easy to determine what's healthy. That's right. It's very difficult. And so that's, I really lay out, like I have a checklist, a healthy relationship checklist in the book. Like this is what a healthy relationship should look like. This is your checklist. Go down and, and let's see how many of these you, um, you know, you, you relate to. Check the box. Um, and, 
Yeah, check the literally check the boxes in the book. And listen, you're absolutely right. I mean, what happens to us is that we and so many of us have been abused in some manner or form or, you know, look, neglect, like childhood neglect is a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. If you're Gen X, like I am, <laughs> like, like we were neglected. We were like the neglected generation, right? Mm -hmm. Um so, like, it's, you know, it's not like they are actively abusing us, although for many of us that was true. But, you know, I mean, I, I had a mom who was a single mom. She was working a million jobs. She was getting her Ph.D., her master's, and then her Ph.D. Like, she was never home. She wasn't actively abusing me, but I was sure neglected. Um, and that's, you know, no fault of hers. She was she was forced to to as a single mom do this. My dad was an addict. He was out doing his thing. He's sober been sober for many many years now and we're very close but like he wasn't there when i was a kid right so i have all of this so this is my blueprint this is my relationship blueprint mm -hmm. when my mother says that she loves me but she has abandoned me or neglects me my subconscious conflates love with neglect and abandonment when my dad says that he loves me, but he's never there and he forgets about me and he completely abandons me, but he says he loves me, my unconscious brain as, an, as a small child thinks that is love, right? He said so, he said that was love. Right. So now when I go out into the world, I recognize these things unconsciously and I'm drawn to them unconsciously because I think they're love. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is part of also the breaking down of like, what is love? What is love? How did you learn to love? How did you learn? What did you learn that love actually is? Because we have to re we have to rewire that we have to, um, because we do recognize these abusive, neglectful patterns. And we, you know, we, we think they're love and they're not. Right. And, and I see that many people don't use the word neglect as often as perhaps we should. Mm -hmm. um, the word abuse has so much power and, yeah. and meaning, right? It's, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, as it should, you know, not to uh, deflate it at all. But the word right. neglect kind of feels like, eh, you know, kind of yeah. like marriage is an obligation and, you know, it kind of makes it sound vanilla. Everything's mm. just sort of like, oh. Oh, vanilla. It's not rubber right. or strawberry. It's just vanilla. And um, I remember that one of the most neglectful memories I had was that I knew that my mother would never go to my high school graduation nor my college graduation because her ballet studio was much more important because oh, she had gosh. rehearsal and a show to go to. So my mother never went to my sister's high school graduations nor college, although my middle sister dropped out. Maybe that's why she dropped out. Who knows? So yeah. I devalued education because it seemed like, you know, well, I mean, I was a good student. I got, you know, I, I right. managed to be fine and went to college and everything. But I didn't right. go to my high school graduation, nor did I go to my college graduation because I knew that, well, my mother was not going to attend. So what's the big deal? What's the point? And I, I rationalized the piss out of that case sure. because mm -hmm. it, it seemed like the norm. Uh, right. So, you know, this conversation isn't, isn't about Kate or it isn't about me, but I'm trying to give you an example, like join the club. I know that there mm -hmm. are people out there that have a hard decision to make about their marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Where are right. you in your marriage and what patterns showed up for you as a child? Now, I did not consciously at the age of 17 and I graduated early um, say, oh, I'm not going to go to high school graduation because mom's not going. Um, no, and, these are unconscious, right? These yeah, are all I ended up getting mono right. so I wouldn't have to go, but that's another discussion. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just remember getting, I met my husband, I was 17, we got married, I was 22, turning 23, and it was on my list of things to do. Like, oh, this is what I've got to do. Got to graduate mm -hmm. from high school, graduate from college, get married, have babies, and right. make life, you know? And right. I, I truly never made a conscious decision. I see so many people not doing this work because yes. by the time they get to me as a mediator and a divorce coach, they're already in the trenches. Yeah. And yeah, there are times when I can try to pull them out of the, you know, 
the trenches a little or untangle the weeds a little bit, particularly yeah. in that world of mediation where, listen, we're going to back up and not talk about the past. Mediation's all about resolution. Let's mm-hmm. see if we right. can with right. an agreement so that you can both move on and start to, to get that help. So now that you've kind of walked them through that, what does a healthy relationship look like checklist? How mm-hmm. many of the boxes can you check? And I don't know if it's requirement to have all of them, but I'm sure the more you have, the better. Uh, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, in the checklist, it's, it's a yes or no checklist really. Right. So, yep. you know, um, you know, it's, I feel this. Yes. I feel, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book about the healthy relationships is that this should be more about how we feel mm. in the relationship rather than like what he's doing, what you're doing, blah, you know, all of that push and pull about like, well, you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing that. How do you feel? Yeah. How do you feel in this relationship? Do you feel emotionally safe? Do you feel like you're able to freely express yourself and your opinions matter? Do you feel physically safe? Do you feel free to be yourself? Do you feel safe to have and express your feelings, right? Can can you, do you feel safe to express your concerns about the relationship or within the relationship, right? So, you know, there's a whole, there's a number of questions here, but it really is yes or no. Do you feel safe? Right. And I, at the end, I say, tally your yeses and nos. And if your yeses outweigh your nos, great. You're probably in a healthy relationship. If your nos outweigh your yeses, it may not be that healthy, but if your nos far outweigh your yeses, then you may be in an abusive relationship. Bingo. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, and then I go into what what all of that is. <laughs> you know, what is an abusive relationship? How you know? Do they know they're abusive? Can they change? What if they're an addict or mentally ill? Is he a cheater or a sex addict? Right. Lots of lots of hard information in there. So leaving the reader with step by step analysis or a, putting a microscope or a magnifying glass, I suppose, more than a microscope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. whatever glass you want to use at the, um, really zoning in on it mm-hmm. with a, a laser focus versus just the big, you know, wide umbrella. How do you um, advise or guide the, the reader to making that decision? firmly versus still contemplating. Because I find that contemplating, the thinking, the researching, the organizing uh, can easily be drawn out for a long time because it's such a hard decision versus, okay, I'm going to do my research, going to read the book, going to really sit with this, but then I'm going to act versus then I'm going to think about it some more. Right. That's a, that's a tipping yeah. that can be hard. It can be. And I address it actually in the, in the introduction, um, you know, as does Mira in her book. And I actually quote her in this um, because, you know, we can sit on the fence for a really long time. Yeah. And making this decision is really hard. At the end of this book, you're going to have all of, look, first of all, if you are people who are in healthy, happy relationships, are not asking this question. <laughs> they're no. just not. Maybe some days they're like fantasizing about like, oh, I'd love to go live on an island by myself. But like, they're not waking up at three o'clock in the morning going, I, is this, I, I don't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. Is it enough for me to go? Right. So you will have all the information that you need in order to make the decision by the end of reading this book. Um, And you may not be ready to make the decision, and that's okay. That's okay. But I want you to promise yourself that you will make a decision because you can, we have made the fence our home. There are times when, look, I have friends who have been complaining about their marriages since I, for for 10 years, and they're never going to leave. They are desperately unhappy, desperately, and they're never going to leave. Yeah. And, you know, that is a choice. And so I want people to understand that, like, if that's your choice, then that is your choice. And then choose it. Choose it. I'm actually going to sit on this fence. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, but not deciding 
one way or the other is, is a terrible place to live your life. Right. And, you know, as Mira talks about in the introduction to her book, um, is that, you know, she, her mother did for 40 years, yeah. for 40 years, she watched her mom, you know, not be willing to answer the question. And, and so she was just simply miserable. And I don't want you to be miserable. I don't want anyone to just mm -hmm. like decide that they're going to throw their lives away and be miserable for the rest of it. Because, oh my God, right. you have, you know, as Mary Oliver says, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? Yeah. This is it, folks. This is it. And I know we talk about that all the time. It's sort of glib and whatever. But like, no, like, really, this is it. Yeah, there's no dress rehearsal. That's right. This is it. So are you going to spend 40 years actively miserable and doing nothing about it? And is that what you want for your children? Because yeah. at the end of the day, just as we just talked about, that you had a relationship blueprint that was handed to you, you are handing the relationship blueprint to your children. What do you want it to be? Do you want it to be long suffering and, you know, martyrdom and right? Like just, well, I made my bed, so I'm just going to have to lie here because by the way, they they pick that up. They know what's up. And, you know, mate, but, and mate, or do you want it to be like, you know what? My mom or my dad or whoever was like a badass and got themselves out of something that really felt wrong to them. And when they're children, they won't understand that. But when they are adults and they watch you live your very best life mm -hmm. and be happy and fulfilled and maybe get into a wonderful, healthy, happy relationship. And also maybe not like, but what is it that you're, what is the message? What is the blueprint that you're handing your children? Yes. I couldn't have said it better myself. I usually say to some people that come to me for a consultation, I said, remember that you are setting an example of what okay. it means to live in the marriage as it is and acceptable behavior is now except unacceptable behavior is now acceptable right um, no matter what you say <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah well mm -hmm. i'm so glad you wrote this book and uh um gave the the listenership and those that are many many people out there are in this situation absolutely yet one more clear uh, precise system to take the time to carefully analyze where they are. It does take some contemplation. You should do the work, make mm -hmm. sure you do it well. And like Kate says, make a decision. And if the decision is yours, it's a decision you can live with versus it being something somebody else made for you. Yeah. Right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, you know, for your, you know, other mediators listening or divorce professionals, I think this is, you know, one of the things that we feel really strongly about um, is that this is a great book for you guys to have on hand for those people who are still on the fence yeah. and coming for consultations, right? They're investigating, they're curious, they're, you know, divorce curious, um, that this will is, a, would be a great tool for you to just hand them and say, it, it's uh, going to be, away. it's going to be on my bookshelf. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you. I'm so glad we had this conversation about your new book, The D Word. Make sure you get it. Make sure you refer mm -hmm. it. Make sure you read it, use it. It's not a Danielle Steele novel. You actually have to do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> not that I'm picking on Miss Steele, but you know, this isn't a book you read and you go, oh, that's nice. And you put it back on the book bookshelf. Mm -hmm. It's, no, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough read. It is. And I say, you know, in the introduction, I talk about how, like, what I want you to feel, <laughs> as terrible as it sounds, is that I want you to feel like, I want you to feel seen and heard. So on the one hand, I want you to feel like you're clutching it to your breast and feeling like, oh my God, she's saying the things out loud that I'm 
only haven't even like given voice to in my head. Mm -hmm. And then also I want you to feel like you want to throw it across the room because, oh my God, I don't want to deal with this. Right. And so if you're having this push and pull with the book, then I've done my job. (laughs) And I do believe reading it in black and white and having it be real um, Uh brings credence to it and validity Mm -hmm. instead of it still being this ethereal thought in your head at two in the morning and Mm -hmm. in a a safe container too. Uh, I'm assuming it's available everywhere, but tell everybody the best way to get it. It is available everywhere. Um, December 26th is uh, the the publishing date. Um, It is uh, available for for pre-sale before that. And it is available everywhere. I do have a um, page on my website, kateanthony.com slash D word, uh, or just kateanthony.com. There's a button that says book. Um, It'll take you there. And I do have some thoughts and recommendations for how people might want to buy it. Um, You know, this is not the kind of book that you want to have perhaps in your shared Amazon order history. Mm. And so that includes Kindle and Audible. And so there are going to be, there are other options and other ways to purchase it that you can, so you can do so privately and safely, more importantly. Very important too, right? Mm-hmm. I'm always asked that question too, but we share an Amazon account. They're going right. to know what I'm buying, right? Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, and it's important. Like it could be a safety concern, um, mm-hmm. or a privacy concern. You want to kind of get your ducks in a row before you drop the bomb. And, you know, that makes perfect sense. So, um, we do have options available for you to be able to, um, brilliant. To to mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yep. Well, everybody, I hope this has been helpful. I wanted to make sure I interviewed Kate as soon as the book was right on the precipice of being released so that we could get it out to you as soon as possible. And um, also, Kate and I are both uh, on the, well, she's one of the, fr- the three that uh, founded the Divorce Coalition. And I'm one of the, uh, I don't know, six or whatever. I lost track. I remember <laughs> asking Beverly a while ago, how many of us are there? She was like, 10. And then she said, 30. I don't know, 40. I'm like, 60. So that's, <laughs> who's signed out? like, who's counting at this point? So there's so many great resources on her website. Check out kateanthony.com. Just as it sounds, easy peasy. Um, get the book. And thank you, Kate. I, uh, I'm thrilled that we took this time to uh, have this conversation for everyone and uh, make sure you get it better. Uh, there's no dress rehearsal. You got one shot at this. Do it right. Do it wisely. That's right. And um, until next time, thanks for listening. Bye.